Let's talk singing. Hi, Fia. How are you doing? Hi, Connor. Very well, thank you. Good. Thank you so much for coming. It's so nice to have you. Oh, thank you. Well, I think you're doing a wonderful thing here. I was really excited to see it, so uh, I'm delighted to be asked. I appreciate it. For a moment. I guess, yeah, I think what's going to be interesting today is it's going to be maybe a small bit different because as we were talking, um, we're kind of both on this journey of, of singing, teaching and finding new paths and the voice science stuff is going to be really interesting to talk about. And I guess it's more so going to be a kind of a... Uh, a back and forth of ideas and and questioning for both of us right it's going to be interesting yeah absolutely like i uh i'm in no way an expert yet i'm and i'm perfectly happy with that yeah uh, i'm just kind of learning as i go and picking up things and tricks and i think it's really nice to talk to experts and professionals who are really proficient um yeah. but it's also really enjoyable to talk to people that are uh maybe a little bit earlier on their journey or yeah. and more in a more similar place exactly um just to kind of have different conversations or you might be a little bit more open or things I yeah think. true because i guess you're you when you're when you're talking to a um a professional or an expert it's it's uh it's definitely more intense in a way because you're really you're trying to gain as much and uh as possible in that moment but it's also i think it's it's yeah it's a different it's a different feeling i guess between two people that are kind of you know starting their journey or you know um as i said kind of on the path of um getting to the place of trying to be an expert in this field i guess mm. which is actually maybe what we could start with maybe you want to do a bit of an introduction to yourself who you are what you do what you trained as yeah uh <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah. um well i uh I'm a singer, vocalist, and voice teacher. Um, I trained, I would have sang since I was a little, since I was a kid and maybe kind of more seriously in my own head from the, about the age of 10. Mm. Uh, but I, I never did exams or classical exams or anything uh, or musical theater exams. It was more just kind of where my interest was taking me. And I probably leaned a little bit towards soul pop um sort of murmurs of jazz in early days and things um and i was also in a choir a very good choir um country yoga hoklia for about well from like the age of 10 till like 16 17 and that was lovely because it was just singing with other voices and um and voices of different kind of ages as well and in harmony and building up all those skills which was Mm. kind of wonderful and a nice way to find your voice a little bit um and then so was kind of singing through school and played piano I did classical piano exams um but like that wasn't my dream I don't know. <laughs> um I just kind of I was so rubbish at practicing I was really not engaged with it so much although it was such a useful thing and it still is um I totally visualize things on the piano as I'm singing or working that way so it's it's uh, very helpful um and then i went and studied uh in new park music center um and got a ba in jazz performance voice so i was there for four years and then finished and when i when we finished up there was a couple of us in my year who um were kind of like what our next step was so uh are wondering what our next step was and there was this idea of oh maybe we could go and work on a cruise ship do the party band thing and train and brush up so the summer after i finished new park having done the really intense um four years and composition and jazz harmony and all these things it was like okay pause that for a second now go in and you we were preparing for the audition that was in september and the set list was like 300 songs. So it was like, okay, let's go learn everything. We're going from country to rock to 80s to 90s. Tomorrow we're looking at Latin stuff the next day. So we just spent that whole summer rehearsing and it was like super intense and super wonderful because um, I had been doing jazz for the past four years and it, like certain amounts of different cover bands or different gigs in other genres, but primarily in that style and using your voice in that way. Um, so then I was thrown into this other um, idea of working on different voices, on uh, different styles and 
there wasn't time to be like, oh, I can't sing that song. You know, you kind of just figure it out. So I was learning pretty quickly and you'd develop, you'd find out how to make those sounds or you'd look at different kind of mimicry or styles and definite, and you built up the strength. And because I had been singing and had a stable, healthy voice in lots of ways, I was able to experiment or find those. Um, so that was kind of wonderful. And then, uh, maybe september october came and we did the audition uh this american cruise ship company had come over and it went really well they were happy with us they were like the audition itself was kind of hilarious and mad like it was an odd experience but anyway uh well enough and they were they were interested in us and they said yeah it was good let's we want to see a couple more examples of you out gigging partying with groups of people getting the crowd going and we'll keep in touch so that was kind of fine it wasn't yes you're the most amazing thing where you've made it you're going to do it but it wasn't or you know there was a certain amount of yeah you definitely have capabilities <laughs> or some level of talent um so then we were kind of still in dublin then working away um doing little gigs but also it had kind of crossed over towards the end of the time in new park we had this is so long-winded. I'd love to be succinct. But anyway, sorry. No, please keep going. This <laughs> the, is great. <laughs> the end of uh, the New Park era when we were finishing up, we started the, we, ha we had had this band that ended up being the cover band, the function band, but also we had started kind of jamming and playing our own stuff and working with Jamel Franklin, who was a rapper MC who had played with mixtapes from the underground and, um, is very proficient very cool talented person skillful um writer and rapper so and he worked in new park so we kind of found each other we had been big fans of him uh so then he came in and started jamming with us so there was little murmurs of that then september time he actually we started rehearsing we we um started writing together and working on things so the band shy mascot was formed developed and uh then we did our first gig, I guess, in December of that year. Um, and then we're kind of playing and writing and recording and doing lots of work. So that's that's kind of built up over the past, I guess, two years now or so and been wonderful. Been Because once again, like uh, I, I'd never rapped and I don't the majority, 19 five percent of the time I don't in the band but there have been little moments or and being in that kind of hip-hop R&B neo soul world is a lovely transition and it's um great music that I get to make with the guys and again a new challenge for myself um so uh then yeah that's been going and we've gotten to play it like Forbidden Fruit and down at uh, Galway Jazz and down at the Kilkenny Sessions uh run by Cormac Larkin so mm. that's been wonderful Mm. and then so that's kind of band things there's a couple other little projects or uh, me as a singer vocalist um and then I started teaching kind of when I when I finished college as well a couple little singing lessons couple little students here and there private students and then I started working in uh Walton's school of music teaching singing there group adults beginners singing classes and mostly one-on-one -on -one. um and it was kind of wonderful and learning so much because you're thrown in. I'd gone from having a small uh, network of private students to having a lot more. I probably have around 30 students or maybe a little bit less there. Um, so, yeah, just kind of th thrown in the deep end and having students coming to you. And a lot of my students are hobbyists and, and I mean that in the best way possible. So they have their careers in other fields and they're just totally enthusiastic about music or something they've always wanted to do. Um, and they, I just find they're very genuine. <laughs> they're very sincere in why they're in that room or why they're singing, do you know? So um, it, that kind of ends up being how I shape the classes as well. It's important to figure out why they're there and what they're hoping to get out of that and what their songs, their motivations are going to be. Um, so yeah that's been lovely and then as I was doing that I suppose I um was thinking yeah I was learning I was educating myself and I was like I need more support I'm work really well if I go into a room and I have a teacher that can explain things to me and I can go ask questions and bounce off and work on things so uh I heard about the vocology in practice forum um 
that through Gemma Sugru's Instagram account, uh, I've never met Gemma Sugru, but I'm a big fan. I've seen her perform a couple of times. Um, and so I just heard about it and I started researching and I was like, this seems really wonderful. And it was being held in Cork uh, last year. So it was like, oh, this seems a bit more manageable than having to pay accommodation in this foreign city or having to travel and pay for flights. I think I can make this happen. And went there, went there and it was just wonderful. And then continued teaching. And also then last year did the BAST training course the be a singing teacher in September I think of last year I did that course um and again did it in person with um Kaya Kaya I think her second name is Herstad but I think I could be wrong which I should double check but mm. I will will tell you we'll tell you <laughs> um but it was wonderful we did it over three days and it was a small small little group of us in person and it was just so brilliantly mind-blowing and informative um in a way that vip had been as well but just it was more interactive like there was and it was a smaller group so that's my teaching and i think i'd like to stop talking for a second and you can say something <laughs> <laughs> no that's so great yeah it's so important and so cool to hear um someone's story right you know you as you were saying starting in, in choirs and then this progression of finding yourself in this world of 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 wanting more mm getting to this yeah. point i think that's so important as a singer of of kind of realizing that there is so much more and the minute i mean it's such an old cliche but the minute you think that you can't learn anymore you've kind of you've lost the match yeah um, yeah and i think that's really cool and um obviously as you mentioned their vip the vocology in practice um through uh, through Gemma's instagram <clears throat> mm -hmm. and then you mentioned the bast course which is really interesting become a singing teacher and i've, I've yeah. looked into that as well and it's something that I was planning to do online at some point, but I yeah. think that, uh, as you said, to have, um, you know, three days in a small group um, with a teacher in front of you, I think I would prefer maybe to do it in person. So I might try and find a place, maybe go to uh, London, I guess they're based in. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, they have them through the UK and it was, it was through... Um... I was at Vocology in Practice and met lots of other singers there uh, and Irish based singers and uh, through different countries. Uh, I met a singing coach, Jen Tully, who um, then after VIP was interested in doing or well, and had been before interested in doing the bass course. So she messaged a couple of us and said, look, is there a gang of us here? We could fly somebody over we could have this course in person so she mm. was the one who organized having Kaya come and join us and we had all met Kaya mm. at the VIP training she had given lectures on um, vocal acoustics and things Amazing. so we knew how she taught and how she worked and she's just so engaging and exciting and something which I think is really um, really admirable and impressive and I'm not able to do but uh, you know you kind of learn or you're developing but she's able to demonstrate every single thing she kind of talks about in terms of changes of larynx position or vocal fold closure or compression and it's just like she's this impressive robot in a yeah. sense or something you know yeah. she can make all these little modifications and just it, it's so clear it's so useful having that in front of you um but but also I think I can't expect myself to be able to do all of that now at this moment. I'm okay with that, you know? Yeah, so. and I think it's also okay um, to, when you're talking to a student and they ask, can they do a certain technique and you can't do it? I think it's, mm. that's what's so cool about the vocology in practice and, and this community of teachers around at the moment is that you can always refer them to someone who can. Yes. You know, and kind of say, yeah. ah, I can't do it, but I know that there's a teacher in this community that I trust and, and that's good and can do this technique and... I think that's so important to have. Yeah. And I think, I think um, it can be any good singing teacher or vocal coach has a grounding, uh, has a basis that will bring a student healthy vocal technique, mm. but to do anything specialized, it's also, um, you probably need to go to a specific teacher or specialize in certain ways. And I think in order to specialize, you, you can't specialize in everything, you know, so you will end up finding some areas they won't be your speciality and you'll need to defer them on or, or recommend somebody else. And I think that's totally 
justifiable, understandable. Absolutely. And I think it's something very important you just said of like every teacher having a ground that uh, grounding that we can we can uh, at least get our student to a place of healthy vocal um, Mm. uh, usage, right, or vocal um, ability so that then maybe the next step is to go then and try and find the distortion or go to CVT or go to some really crazy teachers that can teach you how to, um, you know, throat sing or whatever it is, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so great. Okay, so that's that's cool. And and Shy Mascot, right? That that was that's mm-hmm. the band, right? Excellent. Yeah. I've heard you and I love the videos online. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen you in person. Be- I haven't seen you live because I haven't been in Ireland. But um, yeah. I've been watching the kind of the the excitement and the growth of that band and Andy, right? Andy. Yeah. Andy O'Farrell. Andy, Andy yeah. O'Farrell. Yeah. Andy O'Farrell. Yeah. Is the drummer. He's great as well. Um, yeah also new parkhead right he was in yeah well most of us have come i mean andy's um been in the band uh, very heavily and formed the band initially um and then kind of has gone on uh hiatus i suppose at certain Mm. points as well to have other projects going on and working so we've had other drummers coming in and playing with us um Mm. so but yeah i mean most of us keith the bassist is new did the new park course with me mm-hmm. as well and then graham burke the um keyboard player also went mm-hmm. to new park did the jazz degree so um nice. yeah <laughs> we like <laughs> we yeah <laughs> <laughs> but well also, yeah I, don't know. I mean this this new wave of new neo soul and and hip-hop and r&b mixed with maybe jazz and and kind of i guess yeah pop i guess maybe a funk or whatever it is that yeah. that scene is massive in ireland at the moment right it really oh, yeah. blew up Absolutely, yeah, and we've just joined, uh, or well, we're the this new collective, the X Collective, was formed, okay. um, with a like brilliant uh, group of artists, musicians, um, and kind of production people, promoters of that kind of scene in Ireland. Um, I suppose of of well, quite a range of mix, but really fresh, mm. uh, talented people, mm. um, and it's a lovely group to be in because I think New Park a little bit like um can be separated or ends up being like cliquey or or just other in a different sense in a in a way. Um so I, I mean I'm sure maybe that's changing now that it's part of DCU. Um which could be a good outcome, positive outcome. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um but there, there's mo notions of that or moments of that of feeling like oh I wasn't in that crew or I didn't know those connections and I'm like it's kind of difficult to um what's that word network, network that I don't yeah. love doing but, <laughs> yeah. um. and I, th- yeah, I think you're right I think with the new park with the new new park family and the new park school um um I think it is anything more anything very traditional um which is kind of even though it's it's quite modern obviously the stuff that they're doing but it's it's really based on traditional jazz um, methods of teaching the Berkeley method mm. and all that kind of stuff so it really it's so niche um that yeah you can feel a small bit cut off from the the yeah the working musicians or maybe the new scene that's happening um yeah. but I guess what's cool is is and that would be my question is why then did you why did you decide to study jazz vocals um I was finishing school and I was going to leave and go on and do something else. And I knew that I kind of wanted to do music of some sort, uh, like by process of elimination. It was just like, nope, don't, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in doing anything else. And um, it came to that. And then there was, I mean, I was interested. I, in, I auditioned and got into a couple of different places. Um, but, and BIM being one of them, there was kind of a toss up there for me. Mm. And I think, I think the bit of me, I just felt a little bit com- more comfortable. And to be honest, I hadn't listened to loads of jazz. I hadn't been absorbed in that world before I went. Um, but I kind of felt comfortable when I was singing in that genre or when I was singing some of that stuff where I kind of, and was interested and intrigued by what was going on. Like not having a great understanding of it, but just like, what is that? Like just a bit curious. <laughs> And also I thought, um, BIM, I felt I couldn't do as well. I felt that I would, um, 
wasn't sure exactly of the styles that I would be expected to do or constantly jumping around and I just thought like I could imagine myself really not being that successful at it which I suppose is just my own mindset I think it's really difficult to pick a course when you like even though I'd gone to a couple of open days but just not you know you don't know exactly what it's going to be the content of it or the surroundings you know of um who you're going to be around like yeah. new park was absolutely lovely to be around a lot of um international students and older students uh with a bit of perspective you know like i had come from school and everyone sort of had been talking about the leaving cert and the exams and what was going to happen and like this is our life and then going to new park it was just like people had lived a bit and, yeah. <laughs> and it was like this is a wonderful thing to do so it felt really I felt really lucky and grateful to be there and and engage. Everyone was just clued, clued mm-hmm. in, switched on, like, you know. Yeah. Thought. I think also in New Park, there's this real sense of, of uh, nerdy ambition. Yeah. Uh, it, it really, like, everyone just wants, yeah, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it right. And there's so much information and I'm going to lap it all up. Um, yeah. 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 And, and so when you got in were you what was your what was your first impression of having to let's say uh solo and stuff had you soloed before had you kind of oh yeah yeah so uh (laughs) no i mean no i had not but like (laughs) day one um so day one of the course we had a rhythm class with ronan gilfoyle Mm -hmm. and that was okay that was fine we're all in a room like we'll clap and try and use some conical indian methods that you're like oh this is new this is exciting Mm -hmm. and then we went to our ensemble and um we learned the c jam blues so Mm. which was um manageable as a melody i suppose (laughs) just that one note and then uh, it was like okay off you go solo there and i was like what like i i it was so alien i wish i had a recording of that moment <laughs> like i wonder what noises came out of my mouth because there i don't know what sounds it was at all but like and that was day one and it was fine like i got through it you know and then then there was the next classes and your one-on-one vocal classes and you got to learn a bit and develop vocabulary and i remember um jenna harris my vocal teacher um she had us learn the these blues the cerebon number which was great because there's so much vocabulary there's so much um information in that and just nice mechanisms because mm. um and she would have used lots of like shooby doos and things which i wouldn't maybe tend towards but it's um really great to pick that up to kind of develop it um so yeah yeah, so, yeah but i also it's, i think it's kind of like with that solo stuff in jazz i think there's some there's this moment where you get to when you're learning that when you realize there's so many options and opportunities of what you could sing and can sing, it tends mm. to uh, stagnate your your creative. Sometimes I felt like at the start, I heard singers kind of solo and they were very, they weren't necessarily um, uh, intellectual solos, but they mm. were feeling solos and they were also very nice. And then, the, you know, there's always this curve of kind of like where you get to and you kind of go, whoa, now I need to think about the whole tone scale or now I need to think about what kind of uh, two five one line that I can put over here and it tends to kind of push you down and when well, not push you down but uh yes yeah, rein you in yeah yeah rein you in exactly yeah and then there's this moment of kind of release there where you realize that um your ear plays a huge amount of uh, of a role a massive role in in just allowing your voice to to do those kind of um acrobatics yeah. I guess and I mean, you went to New Park as well for a time. Did you love all the improvising? Do you still improvise a lot in your life? <laughs> in performance? <laughs> my day in to day. day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my whole yeah. life is an improvisation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I live by improvisation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, the thing is, with when I went to New Park, I had been gigging like jazz standards for a couple of years before that. Um Growing up with musical theatre and stuff, we would have listened to a lot of Cole Porter and Gershwin, um, mm. and that was all great. And then I found myself in this uh, this trio where it was two older, you know, like really learned jazz players in Limerick, and uh, they they took me under their wing, and it was a kind of a thing like that in the sense of like we were playing some, you know, autumn leaves or whatever it is, and then the drummer would 
get to the point that it would be the singer's time to, to solo and he would just kind of shout from behind the drums and say, go, go, yeah, go. And I'm like, what, 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 what? And then just something came out and, and, and it was great fun, but it was also terrifying. Um, but you have to have this sense of fearlessness, I guess. And yeah. then learning, let's say like, um, the first thing I learned was the Kurt Elling uh, solo on Nature Boy. When just I just learned that and then listened to loads of Ella flying home and mm. Air Mail, Air Mail Special and the Lady Be Good. And then that kind of vocabulary was just kind of something that I was very um, unique in Limerick. No one was doing that in Limerick. So okay. I felt I had a lot of space to, mm. to try out some things. And then when I got to New Park, then exactly, I was like, oh, great, excellent. You know, just this music all the time and teachers there to kind of go, yeah, that was okay, but maybe you want to do this or you want to do that. And working with Sue and with, um, with Jenna, uh, it was amazing um but yeah soloing and and scatting and improvising is something very very important to me i guess it's something yeah. i practice nearly uh, maybe not every day when i say practice i mean i i go through things that i need to uh, allow my brain to map out where and why and um and i find it incredibly freeing i just find it very enjoyable you know yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely yeah um were you given the opportunity in in Shy Mascot to do a, a uh, like a small bit of soloing, or is that more so uh, lyric with melody? Um, no, I mean like we would do. Um, yeah, I would improvise a bit, and um, if there's room for it, we will put it in or we'll enjoy it because it's so much fun. It's so yeah, good. Exactly. <laughs> it's so uh, it's so great, and it can be so wonderful because uh, yeah. I don't know. It just is good. So there's mm -hmm. there's there's elements of it, but there isn't. There's not loads of it through the music, but mm -hmm. I suppose like the more that we write, and sometimes we might be in the mood to write a tune that's quite free, or will have allow improvisation. And I would use the pedals a bit, so might have Ooh. different effects like um, on it, which are fun to play around with as well, mm -hmm. um, to kind of explore through the improvisation of it. So Absolutely. yeah, it's, it's a bit. Yeah. And so what um, I get one of the questions um, that I wanted to ask was also, I mean, uh, being a female singer in Ireland at the moment, singing this type of music, what's your what's your kind of feeling towards that? Are you uh, do you feel that there's lots of opportunities? Are you welcomed into that world or was it a struggle or do you mean kind of like a hip hop jazz? Yeah, world? kind of. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, like. I've had a really positive experience. Mm. Um, I've I've been around nice people and felt respected um, all the time. And, mm. or, you know, and that's kind of been my experience. I suppose, uh, I'm not sure. I haven't had, I haven't done major thinkings about it of, because of the fact that like uh, the, this kind of Jamel and I both as the front people of it. Mm. So, he's a boy and I'm a girl in a sense that there may be, uh, I don't know, maybe that allows a bit more space or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I haven't, I haven't found, I haven't found lots of coming up against lots of difficulties. I think internally there's, there's funny things. And I think um, people, I probably am a little bit bossy or, um, <laughs> I'm I'm I can be quite uptight and neurotic so there's like for sound text or things I'm kind of like okay don't be make sure you just like calm enough okay just take a little thing or you know um but actually I've I think I've found or I've learned from watching other vocalists that I respect other female vocalists um how to just the wording to use and how mm. to still be assertive and not really give a shit you know like um expect to be respected a little bit and demanded a, a little bit so um i have found experiences to be positive that's great yeah yeah yeah, that, yeah but it is yeah i mean i guess it's 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 important also to voice those positivities that you've had because um i think it's it's more and more uh prevalent that there are many more female singers coming up and coming out and doing this and I guess, you know, the napalms and the 
the Indian Aries and the, the Erica Badus and all those kind of people really paved the way for this kind of um, this kind of music to to include women because a lot yeah. of music um, can be very um, yeah man orientated sometimes yeah 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 um yeah it's a fascinating vast topic like mm. um i've kind of i remember going to um a lecture a couple of years ago and the speaker who i can't remember the name of because i'm useless at names <laughs> um talking about even how we're in training or in education that boys will learn in a certain way that they would learn the um maybe technical stuff first and then go to the creative and women might learn a little bit more creatively first and then go to the technical but we're always taught in how the in towards the male tendencies which is kind of interesting in itself to know that from you know I suppose from early stages these things are ingrained or like veer let's veer off this way or you can go this way um absolutely so yeah I think it's always early stages that's going to have any effect on these changes really or changes yeah. for the good yeah for sure but it also takes like women like yourself and i know jess cav is a real um yeah. you know um forerunner for all of this kind of showing you know female power and in that world of music how how um how important and how open and how accepting the world should be of that yeah so let's start maybe with <laughs> let's go straight in at the top yeah. Uh, chromatic scale exercises and your okay. map of the chromatic scale. Talk to me about what you're learning, what you're thinking about, and your yeah, your project. Okay, so I do have, uh, as I said, lots of hobbyist students um, with different coming from different access points, or when people are wanting coming to singing lessons, voice classes, um, they might have different levels of capability, different stages in their life. Um, and mightn't have lots of theory behind them uh, mm -hmm. or so I think but have very good ears ear training so I think they're not there to do an extensive theory course so it's sometimes you want to find those ways to access things without with giving some knowledge some grounding some um, markers reference points without having to do that so that's the something I should have said something before that which is um we all have kind of the major scale ingrained in our minds especially in western music we're thinking of that um and but the major scale being based on like a tone tone semitone tone 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 semitone pattern which in a ways leaves gaps you know we're not moving um just in continuous semitones which is why i think the chromatic scale is so much fun and lovely to play around because you can learn if we're saying in western music a semitone is the smallest interval between two notes our voice can do these little microtones or be slightly sharp or flat so it's really useful if we're just constantly learning the little notches if we can feel those little eking up in the little semitones as we move through our voice and mm. come back down again so i think it's a really nice thing to sit with to mm. settle with um so then I just wrote down a sentence that fit the amount of syllables that um, were required in order to come back to the beginning of the cycle. Oh, so, okay. and they are, if, for when we're ascending, it'd be if there ever was a greater land in all the world. If there it's ever beautiful. was a greater was a land greater in the in world. In all the world. In all the world, in all the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it can be really nice and you can start it somewhere that's um, comfortable in your voice and then there's I have a different sentence for descending which is I don't think I could contain myself with joy and glee oh, that's beautiful. Um, <laughs> beautiful yeah I'm that's very proud stunning. of it um, but yeah so it can be really it's just useful to sit with it, to settle with it, to work on it. And because it does feel a little bit jarring at the beginning in comparison to a major scale, do you know? Mm. But if you can really slow down and, and play around with this, um, you can really warm up your voice and develop mm. your voice and find your voice. Um, especially if intonation is a problem, do you know, to really work on it um, and being quite patient with it. Mm. So that's over one octave. Mm -hmm. And then you can extend it and do your 
entire range. So your entire range might be one octave. It might be three octaves or three octaves plus wherever you're at. Um, but you could kind of write it out. You're just repeating that sentence um, continuously. So you don't, if we're ascending, you're not going to say the last word. You're not going to say, if there was a greater land in all the, you're not going to say world, but mm. you're going to say if again and keep mm. going. Mm. So then um, my example, so I did it over three octaves for my voice, which is about what my voice can do. Um, and there's certain discretionary tones. So I've written in on the thing, like anything mm. beneath a D3 um, mm. for me is kind of like only in the morning. When I first wake up in the morning, I can get those lower tones. I'm like, God, I have beautiful tones down here. <laughs> uh, and then they're probably gone by about one o'clock or midday or, you know, they, they're not as present. Sure. And then up the top, there's like, well, these aren't reliable. They're not particularly predictable. But if I'm very warmed up, there are days when I've made these top, these top pitches, maybe like a, from maybe a D sharp six or an E six up. Mm. But I have those three octaves. And then of course, within that three octaves, there's different colors, there's different tones, there's different um, textures and strengths and weaknesses in it. So mm. like um, around the A4 mark or in the B flat four, I kind of have, it's right at the top of my chest. Mm. So, or the B4, if I'm really warmed up again, I can have that, chest upper belt sound mm -hmm. but it's again i wouldn't live in there every day and it's like it's an extreme it's it's mm -hmm. not um a comfortable living section use so then there's the cross reference of a mixed all these things um mm -hmm. so and you can kind of put in whichever terminology suits you that's what i encourage my students to do that you can say like love this note like even i just put a little star bet beside f4 because i quite like the sound of my voice at f4 sometimes you know but yeah. you can have different scope or or different zones so you can really apply your own terminology your own words um and then also uh, when you're ascending, it might have certain textures, certain sounds. You might encourage your chest voice for a little bit higher for a few more semitones before you transition to a mix or a, a head voice sound. Excellent. Whereas when you're descending, you might continue that head voice much lower, do you know, mm -hmm. uh, and just marking in those little differences where the overlap is, where you've got that uh, options of variations in texture and sound, um, all these things. And do you think that it's a, it's a, actually, I guess the question is, why did you pick words rather than numbers? Or was that just a, um, uh, was it thought about? Well, as in, would you want me to say one sharp one, two sharp two? Well, you see, three? I don't know. I mean, if you're thinking of semitones, I mean, it's just a question in the sense of, I wonder what the kind of, also the kind of psychological reason for it, or could be for it, for people to kind of, um, combine a, a rhyme or a nice sentence with parts of their range you know I think that's pretty cool you know rather yeah. than making it so clinical or so um, dry with just numbers you know yeah yeah I think that's um, yeah that's a good point I did that on purpose mm. um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah no I think the the numbers could be too cerebral or too many elements to think about and, and too kind of uh, head wrecking in a little yeah, sense exactly. i do find though actually some of the um words like i for example which is a big um pet peeve and maybe we'll talk about it a bit later but like i as a word could be quite well actually no i okay but if mm. different example if's quite small isn't it as a vowel mm. it can be quite uh wide or shallow so it can be a funny one i like try and encourage all my students to quite keep a space keep an open sound yeah. as they use them so that you can really um feel the presence of the tone to not kind of shy away from it this small yeah. sound but really use your clear voice as you do them do you want to give us a a, a bit of an example of it maybe just on one octave yeah, yeah. um Yes, I will. So I also, as I wrote down the bottom, so if I'm doing my three octaves, it's from D3 to D6. That's kind of the extent. If I'm using two octaves, like if there was a, a composer I was working with and I wanted to give them my range, I would say like, yeah, between F3 and F5, I'm 
fine. Mm. Uh, other uh, extended from there are maybe colors. And then for one octave, I would use maybe from A3 to A4, just because that's my faith. That's mm. what I'll demonstrate now. Mm. I don't know, maybe I should take this. I don't know if the sound's going to be affected. Mm. We could be okay. Sounds good, yeah. If there ever was a greater land in all the world. I'm back down. I don't think I could contain myself with joy and glee. Mm, so clean. It's lovely. <laughs> But also, yeah, and it's not a breathing exercise. Like, do have those breaths in the moments that you need them as well. I think. Mm. And I, I, um, I really heard when you, what, what, you, what also what you were saying was to try and keep them kind of, uh, kind of as big as possible, or at least as kind of maybe dramatic as possible. Not thinking about these kind of uh, consonants and explosives and stuff like that. Really, just mm. allowing it just to resonate um, as kind of holy yeah. as possible. Really. So, and I think that's also what you maybe is the the reason is to really you know work in this this intonation right and as you said yeah i think it's uh, just also on a point that you made was when you're going up and a lot of people when you go up the major scale and you're doing these jumps of let's say semitones full one or um full tones um there's a point in which especially for guys and stuff between the e and the f or the e flat mm -hmm. or whatever it is that there's uh, or E and F sharp that there's this this movement of like it's a full tone which means that there um it goes quicker to try and change the voice yeah and I think what's cool and I what I really like about this is that you're giving them the most possibility and most chances possible because you're only going up in small increments of these half tones which might allow yeah. them to kind of as you said hold on before they flip or before they go into that mix yeah Absolutely. I think, I mean, the, what I'll say, or I think what's very common is hobbyists or enthusiasts or singers haven't spent that much time with their voice. And it's really important that you do, you just get to know it and you hear its comfort zones and you hear its um, extremes and its fun color tones or these things to just play around with them. And that's why I kind of like this because it's just you engaging with your voice and being quite slow and minuscule and precise in it. Um, and I think that's key, Do you know, just spend a bit of time with your voice, sing the same thing every day and see how it changes, see how it develops or progresses or yeah. strengthens, you know? Yeah. And I think it's a big point also for hobbyists and even, even, you know, pro singers and stuff that um, yeah. if, if they're just singing songs, um, there's always going to be a point, unless it's in this perfect range that your 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 voice just sits perfectly in, there's always going to be these hairy moments in a song where you kind of go, oh, why can't I do that yet? You know, mm. oh, I'm not good enough. Ah, whatever, singing, whatever. I'll just, you know, I'll just go on with my day because I can't do that little bit in the song. Um, yeah. But I think this way is, as you said, like really finding and becoming okay with your voice and also finding those little holes um, and little weak spots and working on them and yeah nurturing them like absolutely. being kind to them and just yeah exactly having your moment with them like it can do certain things and be grateful for that and like being really supportive I think because your voice is your own instrument and everybody's is different mm. so the way mine works isn't the exact same the, the way mine feels good at certain points isn't the same as what yours are going to be so you have to be your own supporter and be like god listen to that little sound like yeah. there wasn't that lovely or like didn't i do a good job like i think it's really important that you get to be your cheerleader as you practice as you work on things um, absolutely to hear those and things. i think it's harder to be the cheerleader when you go full on for a song first because as i said there are always yeah. points that you can't do yet but mm. then it's always like a bashing rather than a um an encouragement yeah because that's where you focus on isn't it like that's what you hear yeah, exactly. at first like yeah i love it i'm going to steal it and i'm going to practice it and i'm going to let you know how i get on because i really like that good yes cool um yeah i think the sort of what we were about to, or it's sort of hinting on or talking on or slowing things down mm. i think is really useful and it comes up in uh 
in loads of instances or loads of ways as well. Um, just to be patient with yourself and to hear things in music that you wouldn't if it was much faster. So another thing like I'll tell my students is to slow down the playback speed on YouTube. Mm. Do you know, do you tell your students to do that? That no, they can, really. um, so on YouTube, I mean, there's an app called Amazing Slow Downer, which is amazing, mm -hmm. but it costs like a tenner. And if you don't want to spend a tenner, that's allowed. You mightn't have that um, disposable. Um, but the YouTube as well, so you can adjust the playback speed. So you can have it at 75% or 50% or, or, and you can also speed it up. But I think if you're someone who's learning and listening to an artist or listening to some particular point that's quite difficult or tricky, if there's any riffs you're doing, if it's a complex thing or anything to look out for, um, it's just, it becomes so much clearer when you slow it down. And it gives your sense, it gives your muscle memory the chance to uh, create the sounds, uh, form the sounds um, and just kind of, and change positions. You know, if there's moments where you're jumping from quite a low section to a higher, um, any of those things, I think it just kind of, you can really listen. You can mm. open up your ears a little bit more and hear things mm. that you don't at the normal speed sometimes. Mm. I think that's great. And also that, that function that we have now on YouTube to do that, it's really, I mean, if I was talking to like my first like jazz guru that I had in Limerick, Peter Hannigan, a bass player, he was all about the amazing slower downer, you know, and it was, mm. it was get the stuff in, slow it down and stuff like that. Um, but it, yeah, exactly a cost. Um, and so this now function that we have on YouTube, it's great. It's fantastic. And I, yeah. I've never really said that to a student, but I think that's a very important actually. And also could be a really good um, moment for them to really uh, hear what they're doing rather than just flying through a song. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ab absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, you, and you can, it kind of sometimes unlocks secrets of professional singers mm -hmm. do you know you can think like how are they doing that but when you slow it down you can realize oh it was just this kind of an onset or they just added this vibrato at the end or had a little growl that comes in just at this moment or any of those things that when it's fast it just can go by in a blur that you can just like really have a curious little listen to things yeah. and curious there we them. go that's like the, the incredible word to remember is that like when you are learning to sing or when you're going is to be curious about what you are able to do not just about what other people are able to do you know how oh yeah here for you yeah absolutely and i think uh i know from your other podcast with ben wanders of, mm. of talking about mimicry and things um of, of artists but i think it's it's uh really useful and again with loads of different artists not just in the genre in specific that you're looking for but because you something else might work for you some other access point of um you know listening to an impersonation or an impression or a comedian or any little um mimicry device or an animal or a creaky door or mm -hmm. you know you're you're constantly using these things that if you can play around with your voice allow it because we're used to speaking we speak in a very and some of us um might speak in quite a monotone pattern or some might be quite dramatic or lilting but uh we use our voice in kind of the same way every day and then when we go to singing it's kind of opening up this other door of of what can you play around with so like even for myself i remember listening to like chet baker solos or um and listening to the trumpet parts and playing around like trying to sound like a trumpet is lots of fun because it's also kind of a sovt if you're like so it's quite healthy you're quite protected when you're making the sound yeah. but you're also like it's kind of i sort of found my mix voice a little bit that way of just mm -hmm. because you're you're placing the sound in a different zone and it, it feels a bit different like it was uh definitely very helpful for me like you know yeah for sure yeah. Um, i think we we mustn't forget i think that's uh, something that they really ingrain in us in jazz school is to try and mimic instrumentalists yeah you know, as, yeah. because as you said, it brings out something completely different in your voice. And you, as you found, you could find your mix easier. And it's something that unless you do, you never know what the outcome could be. Yeah. 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 Um, Cause everyone should try and impersonate Shakira as well or something, yeah. do you know? Cause it's like, what do you sound like when you impersonate Shakira? You mightn't sound like her, but you might find some other sound through your own voice or some comfort or some placement adjustment or some little thing um 
And those things, again, are really important to pay attention to because the feelings are kind of different for everybody or and the wording the vocabulary might be something else but the sensation is really important to listen to yeah absolutely and i think actually while we're on this mimicry um topic i think i'd like to do uh the the etta and beyonce okay battle with you. just <laughs> while we're here because it's really it's yeah something that re it's so interesting because it's a it's a technique this rattle or growl um whichever way yeah, I guess the, the CVT, the complete vocal technique with Catherine Sadlin and stuff, they, they, they have made it into this um, rattle and growl distortion, all that kind of stuff, all of these effects. Um, but the, really the way I found how I could do it was by making um, funny noises when I was younger. And, oh, cool. Yes. You know, and always taking off like I'm, my, my biggest inspiration for, for comedy was always Jim Carrey and watching The Mask. <laughs> And the mask was just, and you know, Robin Williams and all these kind of people that were just putting on these incredible voices. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's really coming to that point of finding this, uh, this growl, which is kind of, I guess we could put towards the, yeah, how I found it was trying to do Louis Armstrong. I think to myself. Trying to do this Louis Armstrong thing is, is getting to that place of making it kind of bubbly um healthy but it's again from mimicking um mm -hmm. and listening to him how did he do that and uh so so there's a couple of ways that i've i've found that to to try and engage that or to try um yeah to try and access that point in your voice um and i'm sure you've heard these things before but i'm going to try and push you in the direction of of trying to get the rattle and the growl because they're both different yeah. things um so let's do the growl first so um yeah if you were to clear your throat yeah okay. so you can do it very very lightly you can go <coughs> or you can go <coughs> <coughs> yeah right so you want to bring it a small bit lower yeah so you want to get that <coughs> <coughs> yeah exactly yeah and we really we're t we're, t we're thinking of the growl is the the kind of science behind it is the epiglottis going over the vocal cords and the the arytenoid cartilage is actually coming together and and touching off each other which is so crazy yeah <laughs> you feel that your larynx is going to have to rise a small bit but i it can't be as as high as like the rattle which is the <clears throat> which is a, quite a high larynx position okay. so you want to keep it nice and low so let's try and do uh, just a clearing of your throat again <clears throat> yeah, so that's quite airy. <clears throat> so I want you to try and go. Right. So now think of okay. So that's your clearing of your throat, and now maybe try and think of of a Yoda. <clears throat> There you go, exactly, perfect. <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh God, a car, that's strange. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Good, exactly. Can you do that once more? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, <gasp>. okay, wait. <laughs> 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 Oh, I lost it there. It's okay. So think of that kind of clearing of your throat. <clears> it's <throat> kind of low and you need to... <clears throat> larynx goes quite high. And then when you're doing that Yoda thing, try and find that sweet spot and go up in a bit of a siren. That sweet spot and then that Yoda. <clears throat> I'm losing it, I think. Oh, yeah. good. <clears throat> <clears throat> Something good. moved there. Yeah, yeah, so something moved exactly because we have to think about two different things, and I won't spend too much longer on this. But there we have the rattle, which is a much uh, easier thing to do in your higher range. Yeah, it's what um, Beyonce uses a lot of the time, and uh, um, yeah, Etta James and stuff like that. And then you have this growl, which I kind of think that's a good place to start because it's a much lower feeling. Yeah. Um, and it's not, it's something that once you start going above. I don't know, I really, I couldn't really say to be honest of what note, but in your kind of speaking range, let's say, it's a much easier thing to do. 
Um, and when you start going up and up, it tends to get a bit harder when this, this ep epiglottis does, doesn't want to stay there. It wants to release. Yeah, and that was okay. what you felt, that release of the epiglottis. And then it was gone. Yeah. 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 So I want you to try and do this. I want you to go, um, uh, let's go. So that was the growl. So the growl is, again, high larynx and the epiglottis going over. And think of kind of, I see trees of green. Yeah. And it's yeah. this thing of you feel this at the end, you need to release because the epiglottis goes over and the arytenoids come and you need to, you need to yeah. release. But the rattle should be. And that's in my falsetto head voice range. So it's really, there's no tension and it's a much higher feeling. It's much closer. Uh, it feels higher, um, but it's actually, it's. Funny enough, it's closer to the vocal folds, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, but it's with it's it's disengaging the epiglottis, so you're getting that, you're getting a much more resonant sounding, and that's why you can go up higher. Okay. So let's try and go. Um, let's go. Um, uh, let's do the Yoda thing again, but starting from up here. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Can you try and stay on one note, maybe? Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> it's a thing. It's a thing that I guess it's something that you, you you it's something that you need to to once you have the understanding of what's actually going on, and also, um, the, the kind of mechanics of what it should and shouldn't feel like so it shouldn't feel too low that's really important yeah. it shouldn't feel that it's too low because and it's getting too much it's engaging way too many muscles that we don't need to be engaging and uh and ligaments and all that kind of stuff so we need to think of it higher and actually closer to the uvula okay yeah so that uh, it's really yeah <laughs> um so maybe take it a little bit lower in your voice, maybe mid-range. Mm. Right, so you're hitting it and then it's just, it's just, it's also, we have to remember that when we're not, when our muscles aren't used to this sound, it's going to take a while for them to be okay. Yeah. You know, well, you need to do a check back in and see how you've gone now in exactly. a week or something yeah. or a month. <laughs> yeah. And also, I mean, it's very important, I guess, for anyone that wants to try it and stuff is that, you know, trying it. And if you feel a bit of pain, stop instantly. Mm. Very, yes. very, very important. And also um, do your warm up before it. Obviously, do your neck um, warm ups, your shoulder warm ups. Um, and what I like to do is because the, the position of the larynx is so important in this technique um that i like to do the the um the warm-ups of let's say the dopey sound yeah to try and keep it at a nice low position yeah yeah the g g g yeah the real dopey sound yeah and it's so wide and it's so so nice and warm and then also doing the the or the hooty sound yeah exactly so you're really allowing that larynx to go and shoot up yeah and create a smaller space and if you kind of get the movement of both those two um warm-ups you're you're definitely warming up what needs to be engaged for good doing that technique then lovely yeah i love this yeah i'm definitely gonna go and play around with it it's really, it's really cool to do it is and i think what's also very important is to say that there shouldn't be it's 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 a very important point that there is no tension. There's literally a lot of people yeah. think that doing the growl, the rattle, you have to go, Ugh! Ugh! and it's just tension here and stuff. And it's creating like a real compressed sound. Mm -hmm. But actually you really should be getting to that sweet point or sweet spot where you don't feel any tension. And it's literally just a sensation in your, in your throat. And it's a bubbly yeah. sensation. Actually, it's, it's like bubbling. Lovely. Yeah. Bubbling. Bubbly, yeah. bubbly, bubbly, exactly. Um, yeah, but I can imagine I, I'm going to go and practice it. And also I can imagine myself getting 
frustrated and being like Ugh, and then it would turn into a tense thing and i'm like okay and then you can just walk away from it for yeah. the day or for a bit and you come don't back have to get it in one that's the thing just like anything yeah. any singing technique anything that you're doing with students or anything no one has to get it in one right that's the whole point yeah yeah Cool. Yeah. So I'm just looking at the other things you sent on, which are really interesting as well, which is this one, three, two, four, three, seven, one. Yeah. I mean, that was kind of just a small thing that I was enjoying the other day. Mm. It's not a major thing, but just of um, where was I playing it with? But the, the um, I was doing it with students or a couple and I found it was just on an ah. But on the ah, there was this kind of squeeze, this 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 kind of panic. Sometimes when we get higher, we go a bit like, oh God, let's get tighter. Let's raise things up a little bit. Yeah. And I just found going for an ah, uh, that kind of changed it a little bit, grounded things a little bit. Just if you're working on those kind of mixed, um, higher transition in a register kind of zone. To Ooh. use that uh as well can be yeah. a nice way access point. It's lovely, like yeah. into it, which I'm sure lots of people might know, but lots of people mightn't as well. Absolutely, it's always important to to hit it home anyway, even if people do know it to hear it again and again. Yeah. 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 Um. And then I was really like I've been trying to um, I did a voic voic a voice lesson with um Lauren Kinsla in January, which was the best thing ever because i love her Lauren and, um, now is the the dublin jazz singer right she's living in yeah london. based in london yeah she's um she's a band snow poet um but she also kind of is a seasoned improviser and does lots of incredible projects um and she's really um an amazing vocalist she's somebody i always go back to to listen to to hear because she just has such pure tones mm. she makes um, for years I was so interested and uh, enjoyed vibrato so much and then I heard Lauren Kinsella and it was like no just just sing just have this clarity in it mm -hmm. um, and she was you know during the lesson we were kind of talking about just relaxing jaws and mouths and, and having singular vowels having open that people will know what you mean without having to really uh, really over enunciate words although i'm constantly telling people to enunciate but you know that you can it like with the i that i maybe i mentioned earlier but that i has that movement in it that tongue does that i the second yeah. half of a diphthong yeah. whatever but you can leave the second half till till the end and then you can just sit on that lovely open ah like i i and just how you're kind of changing your journey and kind of I, i've been working a lot on um isolating jaw and tongue movements i find my jaw is quite tense uh and like i often think about it i'm like okay i just need to relax my jaw and try and keep it quite still and what what shapes what words can i dictate without having to use my jaw Do you know like rain can you say rain without your jaw like quite it's like rain 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 rain, rain. rain. <laughs> Yeah, it's really right. just the, the, the right. yeah, exactly the the tongue shooting back. Right. Right. Rain. Yeah, right. But I think it's quite interesting to play around with just what you can because frequently we do do so much that supports or hides or masks a transition or an uncomfortable moment just in this this like in our articulators. So just to kind of relax it down, have an open sound, and what can you do when you've got this clean vocal tract? Like what? Absolutely. And then and then you kind of can pay attention to those sounds lower down or kind mm. of in your first formant or kind of around the line. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> That's a whole other thing, right? We could be talking yes. about formants and stuff. But but I think it's so cool because I guess um, eliminating the, the, the need of the jaw to, to enunciate, you're kind of allowing the, the nuances that you can create with your tongue as it's such a huge muscle in your in your yes. mouth. It's impossible to 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 um, to keep tense because if you keep tense, you're going to be, as you said, like masking or like, um, yeah, um, eliminating the possibilities of what you can do. And I think that's yeah. a great exercise of allowing your jaw just to be uh, relaxed and see how many words you can say with just your tongue. 
That's great. Yeah. No, it's totally, and, and like Lauren had me, she kind of wrote out the entire alphabet and was like, okay, go play around with it. These are all the, well, and she was kind of, I mean, she wasn't ex uh, explicitly talking about improvising, but both in improvising and when you're developing words, like how you make the shapes, how you make the sound and how many different options you have in making the sounds. Like if it's, uh, 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 but, but, um, but, that little, um, that partial closure or that full closure that you need, but, 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 and then you can stick other vowels underneath it, you know, um, but like really just playing with the alphabet and it, I, like I love it so much how insane you look as a singer sometimes like you just like I've spent so much of my time because I'm really vain in front of a mirror but also <laughs> because you're just wanting to see those subtleties in your tongue or in your jaw like but, but like just kind of being a bit mad but like they're yeah we have this privilege to study singing or to if you have that time to engage with it and everybody deserves that time and that chance if they're interested to like just explore make some funny sounds make some interesting voices yeah and i think it's it's i, I can't remember who said it um might have been frederick nietzsche uh, that said that you know the the joy once had as a as a child at play is something that we should all be kind of going back towards and finding that joy yes. and and you know, making mistakes and as you said, making ridiculous faces and 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 not being so um yeah, um yeah, not being trying to be perfect in the sense of like especially in the in the field that we're in, in singing and stuff, how emotive it is and how much of it is a part of of um expression and stuff and we need to be able to just express what we want to express, but also yeah push the boundaries, right? And I think that's what Lauren yeah. Kinsler, when I heard her in Arthur's, I think that time I was kind of going, uh, yeah. what is going on? I'm not, what? That's not, is yeah. that singing? Is that what we can do? Mm. <laughs> and I recorded the lesson we did. And I do, I think students should record their lessons, but I've listened back to it so many times. It's so much fun. Like, because we sang, I sang Body and Soul. And then she was like, okay, take solo over it now. Take two courses or maybe I came to the end of the first course and she said do another and I was just like God, what am I gonna say like I was improvising and I was just like I don't have any ideas and I felt mm -hmm. kind of tense and it was I was kind of nervous and like what am I gonna sing and, and got through it and then she was like yeah okay great job she was like you were tense so or you were kind of frustrated so demonstrate that in your solo you know like mm, uh, like uh, it, that can come out in in uh, when you're improvising that honesty you know like mm. which is just she honestly is the best thing and i yeah. always try to calm down but i spent the entire lesson just being like this and yeah, she sure. i think <laughs> i think it was full on for both of us um yeah but in different ways yeah. but i really admire her. i think she's wonderful yeah i definitely have to look in getting a lesson with her i think because it's yeah mm. it sounds so uh, inviting and so interesting for sure yes yeah. Yeah. okay good look um i kind of i have a i have a lesson actually in 10 minutes now so i need to yeah. make sure that we but i want to make sure that um oh yeah uh, like what i try and ask everyone that's kind of coming on um and okay. again thank you for coming on but i want to ask can you give an example of your must-haves or your go-to warm-up routines that people uh watching can maybe try out um ones that you think are important yes um i I found that for me, the lip trill was really useful because I find it a really useful access point to higher notes in my range or in head voice sounds. Um, and I couldn't do it. And uh, then a teacher had me do it all the time or like kept asking for it, you know, so I, you can build it up, I would say. I have had a couple of students who just absolutely can't do it and you shouldn't get frustrated, but it's again, like something to do before you brush your teeth or mm. like, in to play around with this i find that it's just a nice way um to use the sound mm -hmm. um and then i like i like humming a major third uh, mm -hmm. and moving up in major thirds like because i think it's a gentle warm-up but it's quite precise as well it's quite intricate and you're just hearing um and really encouraging a slide as you do it um, so that you're hearing the notches of your voice again, that you're warming up all the sections mm -hmm. and you can really have a control as you do it. Um, I think mm. for me, I enjoy that. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, I, I don't know. Do I, um, 
I think that's they're wonderful. Yeah, and but I, <laughs> but I think <laughs> what's nice about also this this major third like humming, especially I think that's that's something mm-hmm. I would also advocate as in really that is that's the the thing I always start with all of my students. All my students know now that when we start, we're going to start with humming or we're going to do some semi occluded. Yeah. But humming, I think, is just it really is something that uh, you know you can walk around the house doing if you have neighbors you can be on the bus on a loud bus you can be doing it to your you know humming yeah. and you're just allowing this to really nicely flow and warm up without overburdening it with too much pressure or too much yeah. consonant or thinking about resonance and stuff it's really nice and yeah. I like this thing of doing the as you did the 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 the, the third um, going just between the the first and the third because that's so satisfying and we mm. all know it. It's a real lovely feeling for us. Yeah. Back down. Yeah. Yeah. I do think as well with the home, like the, the difference bef- between uh, a really quiet and the forward place are quite different. You do want that 100%. forward sound that I would try if you're warming up just because you're, you're trying to create a sound that you can translate to an audience or transfer to an audience. And that isn't going to travel the same way no. you're not going to have the same vocal fold closure so like sure. f- try- and that takes time as well and and that as well is why i like the the trill because the trill is mm. so far forward it's just ready mm. to unleash mm. so even going from the and trying to keep the sound nice. in the same place i like to yeah so keep that forward placement for both and kind of if you find yeah. a sweet spot in one maybe try and hold it on the other one or if you yeah. don't find it here and you find it here like when you come back, try and find it again. All of those little tricks are so nice, right? And, and mm. kind of allowing people to feel resonance in their mask or in their face or behind their eyes or whatever yeah. it is, or in their vocal tract, and then moving it to another place where you're going, and you can actually do it in this place too, and yeah. on this uh, note or on this scale or whatever. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Fia, this is so cool. I loved it. I really did. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I feel like, I hope I rambled in somewhat of a succinct way, but maybe I didn't. I think rambling is so important, but it wasn't rambling, first of all, but also like speaking yeah. and, and especially, I think it's nice for us both to have this chance of just kind of just sitting and chatting. You oh, know? yeah. Um, yeah, I, I really don't... enjoyed um, yeah. speaking with you. I think you're wonderful. I think you're a wonderful artist and <laughs> an engaged learner and teacher. And thank you. Um, yeah. nice to see you nice yeah to hear you too you. and we'll link in again and you know i'm sure that this isn't the, fir- the only time our paths will cross on this um journey of of um yeah of learning about the voice yes cool. yeah okay cool okay. so Brilliant. best of luck in all your projects and stuff yeah um thank you i'll thank keep you. an eye out and i'll put it all down in the video and stuff and and uh, links and things like that and yeah marvelous thank cool. you so much no have a lovely day you too <laughs>